strike on land with tanks against horses, giant guns against sabers and rifles. Choose your time carefully, making sure the weather favors your machines. Strike at his cities so that civilians will take to the roads, hampering the armies, so that women and children will be killed in the streets or in hastily contrived shelters. Strike again, repeat the dose, day after day, and then add a drop of treachery in the form of fifth columnists. This was Warsaw. Repeat for 18 days. One Nazi pincer cuts the Polish corridor. Another races to Krakow. From East Prussia, another army moves on Warsaw. Encircled, bombed, shelled and starved, Warsaw surrenders. Now, over the roof of city, send your Luftwaffe sailing leisurely to photograph your handiwork. And on the ground, let the master race assemble the first of its slave populations a stunned and shocked and hungry people whose sufferings do not end with the armistice nor their resistance. The winter of 1939 and 40 was described by amateur statesmen and strategists as the period of the phony war. True ships were sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic and men died in this phony war, but there were no land battles. France was waiting behind its Maginot Line that vast underground fortress deemed impregnable by its military experts. A large strategy relied upon starving the Reich into submission. Hitler's armies would collapse for lack of fuel and food and raw materials. Spring shattered this comfortable illusion. Norway and Denmark had staked their survival upon the strictest interpretation of neutrality to escape the war. Their sympathies were with the Allies, but they took extraordinary precautions to avoid offending Hitler. So, on April 9th, Hitler invaded Mark and Norway. Denmark was powerless to resist and didn't. Norway was stunned by an avalanche of force and treachery. Invaders were hidden in merchant ships in Norwegian harbors. Fifth columnists, led by Major Quisling, a Norwegian traitor, spread panic and confusion. On May 9th, Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium. These nations, too, hoped to avert war. And these nations, too, minded their own business and spoke softly. But Hitler struck at them, again without warning. 
because he had decided the Battle of France could best be won by outflanking the Maginot Line. He had no quarrel with these nations. They were merely convenient roads to France. Simultaneously, the Nazis smashed across Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. This pictorial record you are watching was made by Nazi cameramen at the order of Dr. Goebbels, the German propaganda minister. He showed this Wagnerian symphony of devastation to neutral nations in Europe and South America to frighten them into surrender. You will observe that here in Holland, for example, not one German soldier is killed or wounded or even suffers a fractured ankle in an avalanche of destruction. For Dr. Goebbels is a showman, and what he is ballyhooing is the mystical invincibility of the Nazis, or at least that was his theme song until Britain refused to surrender to Air Marshal Goering's armada and until the Russians slaughtered well over a million of invincibles. To the now familiar recipe of the Blitz were added parachute troops who swarmed down upon Dutch cities and airfields and further disrupted a hopeless defense. Men had discussed and most armies had experimented with this new dimension in mobile warfare, but the Nazis were the first to use parachutists in force. Guns and ammunition sailed down in special parachutes and were assembled quickly on the ground. Thus, the Nazis could capture and destroy airfields, railroad stations, and other strategic points back of the defenders' lines. Using tanks, dive bombers, big guns, The Nazi machine broke the back of Dutch resistance in four days. Towns and villages were in flames as the invaders rolled on at a breathless pace, encircling the defenders and slashing their armies, destroying in the name of the new order the homes and shops of those who had dared to resist. Bewildered refugees clogged the roads, seeking escape where there was no escape. This was Rotterdam, bombed after the Dutch forces had surrendered. The Nazis said there had been a mistake. The news had not reached the Luftwaffe in time. When the Nazis entered this once prosperous city, the night skies were red with fire. And the next morning, reconnaissance planes flew over the city as they had flown over Warsaw, recording for the propaganda ministry another tribute to the efficacy of the Luftwaffe, while Rotterdam buried its dead as Warsaw had, and formal negotiations for surrender were duly completed. <laughs> 